Hi guys, hope you're well. Uh, I must admit, it's got a really exciting one today. Uh, I'm chatting with a guy who I'm going to introduce introduce you to, to in a second. But actually, we were just talking off air because Peter's really into his kind of social media and stuff as well. And as I've kind of gone through this journey myself with the podcast and the live stream and different things, we were literally just talking about how, uh, for me, I'm not afraid to kind of share the journey and the different things we're going through. But then likewise, each week, trying to make it that little bit better, uh, share different things that we've kind of done in the past. And actually, this is the first time I think genuinely with Peter that actually we've got people watching live. So no, guys, thank you. Uh, and actually, we have... Uh, ready for questions so if, you, if there's anything you want to ask Peter I'll definitely kind of bring it at the right point and then for me myself so this currently goes out live on YouTube I then kind of clip it up into lots of different bits the full interview stays there then I'll pick out the kind of few different the main kind of topics which stay on YouTube but then hopefully moving forward I'm going to start restreaming at the same time on LinkedIn and Twitter and a lot of different things and basically this is almost you know, the, hopefully the start of a, a new exciting kind of journey for me. And then with the kind of growth strategy, uh, like live stream and everything that we're kind of doing, it's all about introducing you to real people who are interesting. They're going through their own journey. They're probably very similar to kind of where you are. And actually, it's great to kind of pick their brains and learn their story and kind of just, you know, talk things through together. So bringing them in. Hi, Peter. Do you want to say hi to everyone? How are you doing? You all right, Steve? Yeah, good, good. Good um, stuff. So our, I always ask every guest, how did we meet? Yeah. And actually, I'm not entirely sure how we did meet. I know we met for uh, a coffee in Costa near uh, Middlesbrough Stadium. But then from your point of view, how did we meet? I remember going to, um, when I was working in engineering, I remember going to an event at, I think it could have been Middlesbrough College, maybe talking about the apprenticeship levy. And our, I, I'm sure that's what it was about. And, I remember watching um, you. I think it was an event that you organised, and okay. uh, and I start, I've started following you on social media then, and then I have done ever since, and that's probably going back six or seven years now. So um, I've obviously always watched your social media, and then obviously we met up and we get on quite well. So as soon as I heard that you were doing this, I thought, yeah, I'll be a part of that without a doubt. No, it's cool because I must have when um, so we had met up for coffee at Costa. And actually, what, what what I loved and what I kind of hope comes across, you know, from this is almost just, it was your passion for what you're doing. And actually, one of the things that was also true, and actually, I'll, I'll go on to tell the story in a second, but it was almost, it was almost your passion for what you're doing, your um, desire to kind of work on the craft, uh, as in like we both uh, follow a guy called Gary Vee, um, but yeah. almost the, the the hustle that goes with that and actually the, the effort that goes into social media and sales. Um, and basically I really kind of resonated with what you were saying, but actually a lot yeah. of your kind of passion, like genuinely kind of came across. So I must, Good. we've both got a brew, um, and just, I'm going to sit back, let you kind of talk to everyone for a few minutes and just tell them, you know, who you are, what the business is and kind of how you got started. Yeah. So I'm Peter McKeown. and I'm from Middlesbrough in the Northeast of England. So, uh, I'm 33 years old. I run a, a spice merchant business called Diablo Seasonings. Um, so I grew up in Pannister Park, which is in uh, it's TS3, Middlesbrough. So where I grew up, you could see the Transporter Bridge from from the field where we used to play football. So a bit of a boring lad. And um, as soon kind of in school, I, I don't know, I, I found school a bit of an uninspiring kind of um, environment. I, I just felt a little bit stifled. Quite enjoyed English and music, but... Um, just wasn't for me. I was just really bored a lot of the time, and that's no disrespect to the teachers, but it just wasn't for me. It wasn't my kind of environment that my learning style thrives in. So, as soon as I left school, I started working at uh, Virgin in in Middlesbrough. We we had a call center in Central Middlesbrough. I learned a lot in those first couple of years working in the call center um, about sales, about you know selling bits of phones and stuff like that, and uh, just being a, a responsible cat or borderline responsible um, adult, just going to work in a suit, etc. Just getting used to working in it in that kind of businessy environment. Just and to then kind after of chip that, in uh, on the, yes. I've also worked in a call center, and I absolutely yeah. hated it. I worked in, it was yeah. Labrooks, so the Telebetting oh, yeah. call center. So Sounds I grew up terrific, near uh, Ancient Race Course. And uh -huh. it was when, uh, basically it was a summer job when I was at uni. Yeah. And they were, the shifts were brutal. And they, you know, it was just, yeah. but like you, you had to work every weekend. And my girlfriend at the time yeah. and our wife was in Darlow, so she was in the Northeast. 
but it yeah. meant I couldn't travel up. But it was just I yeah. just hated it. So it's I anyone that can actually stick out a course then to but you know learn their craft That's it. there. And, I know. think you pick up so many skills in that kind of environment. Like after the call centre, I did about nine years of field sales, which is effectively door to door in the domestic energy market, and it's pretty horrendous. You know, getting insulted on a daily basis and um, working twelve hours a day in the rain, in the snow, getting bit by dogs, etc. Um, I think at the time, though, like you just you've got to stay motivated. But now I look back, I think that was horrendous, really. But that's molding you, isn't it? In your teen years and in your twenties, that's molding you for when you get a bit older. And, and nowadays, like no matter what situation occurs, whether that be business or life, I just know I can deal with it. Because uh, you know, when you, when you've knocked doors all day in the snow and you, you haven't quit, it kind of gives you a thick skin, you know. So no, I, I must. I completely agree. And it's that balance again, where you're kind of. Uh, you know, past career history, you know, almost, I, my uncle once said to me, I was in the garden as a kid, probably about, I don't know, 12 years old. And he he yeah. referenced back to in his career, there was loads of random things that happened, but as he went through, they seemed to somehow piece together. And I've definitely yeah. found the same, just loads of random stuff. And it could be that the piece, the glue is actually you, but actually, yes. you know, so I've worked in uh, call centers, supermarkets, uh, loads of kind yeah. of different jobs. But my point is yeah. but you do learn your craft as you go through that. And then ironically, when you kind of finally get a good gig, uh, because yeah. you've had shit jobs, you almost appreciate it more. That's it. Without a doubt. I think going to work in engineering in 2014 uh, and ending up working at TTE in South Bank and working with their team and, and just like – Going, it's it's a job of comfort, you know. It, it's a challenging job, obviously, but you would be getting picked up in a nice car, going to a nice hotel in Aberdeen, etc. Uh, flying up there, whatever, all these perks of the job. And I would sit back and think, wow, I used to knock doors in like Park Clarence all day and get abused all day, and now this is sweet, you know. Um, and it gets to a point where you can start to afford to travel as well. And I think mm -hmm. all those experiences have definitely had a major influence on me, definitely. So out of interest, so you obviously had a lot of kind of salesy type jobs. And you've, yeah. you've obviously got the kind of the, uh, the pate, you're not afraid to kind of talk to people. How did you kind of discover food, discover spices and kind of how did that sit yeah. on the, the path you're on now? Do you know what? It was kind of like, I, I love other cultures. I like um, exploring different countries and things like that. And I think the, the best way to sample a country's culture is go straight to the food. Um, I mean, around about 2010, when I first met my, my girlfriend, Jenny, who I'm with now, uh, we've been together 11 years, we started traveling together. And I, I, I'm quite, um, I, I, you know, I'm quite kind of i'll eat anything obviously <laughs> we're at all these different markets all these different restaurants and i'm like yeah i'm not a bit of that and um just over the course of the, of the few years of traveling around like north america and the middle east and bits of africa and stuff asia you, you when you come back to teesside I, i'm searching for these foods i put a post on my social media yesterday um there's a picture of a shawarma shop in bethlehem in palestine it's the first shawarma i ever had that and then i'm getting back to borough and I'm starting to spot the shawarma shops that wouldn't have drawn my attention before that. And um, now I think they're the best lunch ever, to be fair. So. No, I think it's, it's funny because I've kind of, I have traveled a bit over the years. Yeah. Um, but I've never been to a lot of the places you've been to. And it's um, okay. some pretty kind of uh, spicy areas. You know, it's extreme. Because <laughs> yeah, I must I love it. One of the, the questions that I was going to ask is almost with, how have you found the transition? So, for instance, I grew up in Liverpool, not that dissimilar to Borough. I won't lie, it's a bit posher yeah. where I grew up, but, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. But actually, I the I, I don't know if I would have been ready until I was maybe mid to late 20s to go to some of these kind of, like Bethlehem, where you know there's a bit of an undercurrent. And, you know, some yeah. of the other places you've been, like in Morocco, it's how did you find that, you know, your first kind of your, your overseas trips? It's some of them. Like, for example, I, I, I was quite shocked when I went to Jerusalem on the way to Bethlehem. Uh, I didn't expect to see so many guns. It's not something I've really experienced in my life. And I remember being at the border uh, before I was interrogated for a number of hours, which was fun. Um, the border in Egypt crossing into Israel. And um, there was a kid 
Uh, he was no older than 13, and he had a proper Kalashnikov, you know, an AK. Um, and he had all these drawings that he did, like little pretty drawings that he'd sellotaped to the uh, the magazine on the gun. And he put it on a um, on a bench and then walked away and left his gun unattended to have a smoke. And I was thinking, a different world, this, like, you know. Yeah. I was thinking, anybody could grab that, what are you doing? I was like, mate, you left your gun here. And he's like, oh, yeah, I went and got it. And there was only, <laughs> it was just a bad, mad experience, you know, like, I think you, you, after a few days, you start to get used to it, I think. Um, I found that when I lived in Kingston, it was the same. Yeah. That some of the, yeah. you know, there was times, I won't go into detail, but you also saw guns and you were occasionally threatened yeah. and sometimes yeah. by the police. And it was yeah. just, oh, it's, it's a different world. But after a while, you do become numb to it. But I think for me, it was, I found that whole experience of working in MTs quite difficult. And I think I became unhappy. Yeah. And when I became unhappy, I start, I didn't care as much. And when you didn't care as much, you then, you know, yeah. it's a very kind of Become different. a bit more reckless and, yeah. But it, but again, a great life experience that I'll do at 24. It is. At 36. Definitely, yeah. like, <laughs> I think, like, you, you can't be intimidated by some of these places. A lot of the time... I think if you do your research, like, for an example, um, the Rabat trip, which I took recently. So we went to Morocco, you can search for it on YouTube, Diablo Seasonings, and um, we did our research, and I did know that the area we were going to was the roughest part of the city. But it, all I'd read on, online were positive things, really, saying if you keep your wits about you, if you don't, if you if you're not stupid and... You know, you don't walk down any dark alley. We ended up having to walk down a dark alley, actually, in the guest house, but uh, that wasn't our choice. Um, as long as you've got your wits about you, also learning a bit of the local language goes down an absolute treat. As soon as you can ask for directions in, in a, a local native language, then I think you, you're instantly gaining people's respect. And also, we do walk a bit like Liam Gallagher as well, so we've got a bit of a mm. bit of a, a vibe. So they might think we're English football fans, possibly. I don't know. But, For um, anyone that hasn't seen it, I would definitely recommend Peter's video on YouTube. It is actually very, very good. The, even from a, as someone that makes vi videos and edits them, it was it's a hell of a lot of work, isn't it? A lot of work goes into it. And oh, I love yeah. the kind okay, of the, the yeah. storytelling with your mate that you went with. And he, he I seems, doesn't Brian. seem to know what he's getting into. But again, but yeah. what it does from both uh, an entertainment point of view, but also from a business yeah. point of view, it genuinely takes you on a story. And then back it to does. your other point is almost, I've, I've always found that, like we went to Rio uh, oh, 12 yeah. years ago. And wow, a lot of the guidebooks, but a lot of the guidebooks, yeah. oh, don't walk around. It's not that. I just, you know, I just, we walked yeah. everywhere. And realistically, same in Kingston, same in a lot of different places. As long as you treat other people with respect and you're not an idiot, yeah, they're generally fine with you. Um, that you know, yeah. speak too soon. But it's just, it's. Uh, but I, I think, yeah, people often, you know, worry too much about different things. I think so. I think certain like elements of the press in this country can give places a bad name as well. Like when I, when I was telling people, look, I'm going oh, to the Middle Castle. East. People, yeah. <laughs> people were saying, you know, you're going to the Middle East, what you're playing at and stuff. And you get there and you, you realize that the average man on the streets, just like us, really, they're spot on. Like the are down to earth, they're pretty sound. I, I found that basically I was in Abu Dhabi uh, five yeah. years ago. Yeah. And it was, there was a massive military show on, like a Tony Stark oh, kind right. of proper where they sell uh, pl uh, missiles and planes and stuff. Wow. And it was like, cause I'd been a few times with work at the time, but actually there was a, a genuine kind of uh, US war carrier, like Abu Dhabi wow. small as well next to it. Yeah. But in my boss, Brian at the time booked us into this really cheap hotel. I mean, like it was nasty yeah. and there was like this Filipino bar underneath that I remember oh, yeah. going for a drink one night. There was a guy with a swastika tattoo on his arm. There was loads of American. They're not squaddies, but they were like, uh, you know, the, the like veterans, like no, no, like the guys that you hire. Uh, what are they called? Yeah, 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 like, um, the independent yeah, contractor yeah, like, kind of guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but at that point, there was a tension, and you could feel it, and it was like, yeah. Oh. Sat in the bar with loads of guns for hire. Sounds like an interesting night. Oh, it's just some of the hangovers and stuff from that kind of place. But that, I'll save oh, that yeah. for another kind of live stream. <laughs> anyway, yeah. it's 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 actually it's quite funny. You when you register a live stream for YouTube, you have to click. Is it appropriate for kids? <laughs> oh yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, so back to yourself. So how did okay. you then come to set up your own business? 
I'd known for a lot of years that I needed to do something myself. I mean, when I think back through every job I've had, uh, I must have been a nightmare to manage because I'm a bit of a maverick, you know what I mean? I've got my own way of doing things. Uh, I, I always, every company I work for, I had the company's best interests at heart, but um, I would, all, and I'm quite outspoken if, if somebody says, if there's somebody in a management position that does or says something that I don't like, I'm calling them out on it. And that, you, you've got to be a bit more um, tactical in the, in the world of work these days, haven't you? So, um, there's, yeah, there's been a number of times where I've kind of fallen out with people and it's, it's only because I care, you know what I mean? But um, I'd, I'd known for, especially the last three or four years, I knew that it was getting to a point where I was going to start my own thing. Um, it was it was on my mind 24-7 and I think if you're thinking about something so much, you've got to do it, you know. If you've got an idea and you're waking up on the morning and it's the first thing you think about and then you're laid in bed at night thinking, right, what can I, you know, you've got to go ahead and make it happen or you're going to regret it when you get older, aren't you? One of the things that oh. I, uh, when was it? Oh, I think it was in at the start of 2018. I built a website for a consultancy okay. business that yeah. I obviously never launched. And it was oh, okay. just, I'd, I'd kind of I had it in the back of my mind and I thought, yeah. my wife's never going to be supportive of that. And actually I've got a good opportunity yeah. and whatever. And it was almost where, you know, luckily, as we were saying before about how, you know, things sometimes kind of fall into place. That yeah. I, I, When I built the roadmap kind of website and everything I've kind of got now, I used a lot of copy and pasted it across. But it was almost where yeah. if you've got it inside you where you've just got that itch that you want to scratch. Yeah, exactly. it's because it's, it's almost a, a conversation where unless you do something disastrously wrong, you can yeah. always get another job. Of course you can. But it's that balance. That, I think yeah. a lot of people live so cautiously and they think, oh, but what am I going to do? I can't just quit my job. And that's right. But what you can do, as you've probably seen in Gary Vaynerchuk's um, content, is if you go to do your nine to five, you get home. You, yeah, you might have a family, but the kids are in bed by nine or whatever. So I'm you in bed by work nine. On your in your spare time. <laughs> you can sit and graft on your own thing. Uh, there's always time. So many people are glued to Netflix, me included, man. You know, I watched Tiger King. It was entertaining, but I should have been working instead of watching Joe Exotic's music videos. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I made it halfway through actually no it wasn't even halfway through it was about 15 minutes into the first episode yeah. and I had to turn off I couldn't yeah, have so it. You, you know what you dodged a bullet there like Steve definitely <laughs> on that topic just because I think it's interesting and so when how did you kind of weigh up the pros and cons because you've got uh, you know family yeah. almost yeah. the gamble which it is it's a gamble to kind of set yeah. up on your own and like turn down a regular paycheck how did you weigh that up to then decide to go for it i just think like the i did a lot of things in in the the 18 month to two year before i actually launched so i've been going for six months now launched like uh, end of november and um for 18 months before that I, what i was doing is i was making the, the the environment for my future self as kind of easy as possible so what i did is i paid most of my debts off um, I downgraded my car, no more daft Subarus, no more stupid cars. Um, I stopped kind of going out as much, going to restaurants, going to bars and stuff like that. Music festivals as well. I swerved BBC Radio 1 the big weekend. It would have been awesome to have that in my own town, but I, I had to make sacrifices. I didn't go on that many trips abroad unless it was going to benefit the business. Um I also sold my Xbox, my PlayStation, and my guitars, which I like it downtime as much as the next man. But um, the reason I did that was just to put myself in, in the best possible position so that the, the risk was getting lower and lower to, to my, kind of my family's future, you know what I mean? Um, I just think it was such a wise thing to have done. Now looking back, seeing as though we're in this current situation, and I can't do any markets, so I have to fully rely on online sales. So uh, obviously income's quite low compared to what it would have been if the markets were on. Um, but because my outgoings are now so little, so small, um, I've kind of, um, I would have had to fold immediately and get a job, whereas I can keep on going. I'm six months in, and, I, and that because of those decisions made two, two, two and a half year ago, um, I'm able to continue and, and pursue this, you know. No, it's also because one of the things that I almost found is that with uh, 
So I just saved up a lot and almost got your... Okay. Did, did you actually... I'm asking just because I think it'll help other people who are looking okay. and considering this. Did you actually plan out your runway, how long your cash would last before it would run out? I did, and it probably got wiped out about a quarter of the time I thought it would, wow. to be honest. Yeah, so um, maybe my anticipation wasn't as good as I thought it was, but I think like... Everything took a lot longer than I thought it would to get together as well. Um, well I thought, thought I thought that it would take maybe three months uh, to, to kind of, um, after having the idea, and then it just took time and time, and I thought, I need to keep on working. I was at TTE at the time, and uh, and I love those guys, by the way, if you're watching. Hang on. Um, whilst I was working at TTE, I was kind of um, devising this plan but I knew that there were still elements of business I needed to improve upon before taking the plunge. Just little things like sending invoices and kind of uh, profit and margin and, and all that kind of thing. And um, working in that environment um, in the office with the, the, the ladies who process the sales and stuff was actually uh, invaluable, really. I learned so much from, from those guys. And I still uh, implement a lot of what I've learned at TTE into my business and the way I run it, you know. No, I respect that because I think one of the things that a lot of people get wrong is that they expect things that will happen quicker or they yeah. just assume it will be easy. And I think almost oh, yeah. with, I actually, it's funny, I'm, I, I, I'm not pessimistic, far from it, but I'm very realistic and it's almost yeah. where, you know, so and one of the things that I speak about quite a lot and it is almost at the, so I'm 36 now, 37 in June. Um, 21st of June, if anyone wants to buy me anything. And uh, <laughs> anyway, but my plan always was, was to do this when I was 50. Yeah, so the, right. the way that I genuinely approach it, which probably is just a mental trick to take the pressure off myself, is almost, yeah. I, I do it with like a 10 year horizon so that all of my, my YouTube live stream, it's a, it's a Gary V thing. You know, people always yeah. give up because they don't have any success in six months. I'm yeah. not aiming for six months. I'm doing this because actually it. I enjoy the chat. I'm locked up all day every day. Yeah. But actually I enjoy talking to people. But I'm actually aiming for a 10-year horizon on a lot of my stuff. Same. Definitely could not agree more. Like, I think you've got to look at your long-term legacy. So I think like, everybody starts with zero followers and – over the course of time, like if after a year somebody hasn't got 10,000 followers, they can become kind of a little bit um, disillusioned, but it takes a long time, man. Like it's taken me now. I was writing the blog for the food blog for about 18 months before I launched. I'm probably about two years into the food blog and I'm up to about, about 6,000 followers, something like that, across Facebook, intra, uh, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, um, Snapchat stories, all, all. I try and use them all um to, to varying degrees and, and i'm up to like i say six thousand but that might not be like a uh, hundred thousand followers but the audience of the community that i've been building are quite an engaged audience so because i've earned them i haven't went out and paid thousands of pounds for ads and bought new followers i've earned them by writing content that's helpful about food that people have seen a recipe and thought oh that's interesting i'm going to share that somebody on their friends list has seen the recipe that I've, that I've written that somebody shared and then they thought, oh, I like that kind of thing. I'm going to follow this guy. And because they like food and everything that goes along with it, if I was to go onto my Facebook now and write, what's everybody cooking on the barbecue today? I'll guarantee you get all the different answers saying I'm making this, I'm making this. So it's an engaged community. And I think in the long term, that's going to benefit me as opposed to just splashing the cash and just buying a load of followers, you know. One of your engaged community, <laughs> it's a guy called Craig, uh, Craig Reedy. Yeah. Is the... Okay. <laughs> I sent you a nice smiley. So Craig, just okay. shout out, you're the first person to ever comment on any of our live streams. So I appreciate that, mate. Um, He's known as Billy, Billy the Kid. Hey, <laughs> Billy, you all right? Thanks for the uh, the watch. I'll see you soon. <laughs> but no, but I, I think it's a genuine thing that people often... Um, they expect results too quick or be too easy. Yeah. But because one of my big things as well is that with, so our businesses, which we'll touch on are fundamentally different because mine, it's split between actually, I even tell people how my business model works on the website. It's split yeah. between paid consultancy, which is what I do all yeah. day, every day in the daytime. Yeah. 
then yeah. there's the option to invest in certain companies to get equity. And then as I go in to grow the company, they might not pay me okay. as much, but actually, you know, you make money over time. And then some of yeah. the kind of scalable stuff to do with kind of like online training courses and different things that I'm building. Okay. So even on that kind of point, the I bought the URL uh, last week, which was a major step okay. forward that I'm not actually going to launch nice until one. the end of the year, but it's all these little okay. baby steps. But my point Cost is that it. for the majority of my business, which actually pays my bills and pays my wages, I don't need a big audience. You know, realistically, yeah. if I connect with five people, but they're five business owners who are, have ambitions, that aren't happy with how they're going and they want a bit of help. That actually is what I'm looking to do. So again, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to build a, a much more engaged, well, arguably smaller audience, but actually yeah. where you build trust over time and you get to know people and their backstories and their network, because that, yeah. that's actually what I'm looking to build. Uh, and then actually yeah, one of that's more, the way to go, definitely. But, that is know, the way to go without a doubt. But I think, you know, I'm streets behind you in terms of engagement because yeah. you you get a lot of people that are passionate about food, and actually, it's something you can interact with and practice very quickly. As where if you speak to uh, a lot of kind of business owners, it's not something that you can magically just you know. It's yeah. a, it's it's a thing is with food. You've got like a, a million different recipes to talk about. There are two hundred and odd countries in the world recognised by the UN, and a couple more that are not recognised. Which I'd like to visit them all. Um, and. You've, you can talk about different cultures because it all ties in with food. Um, the ISO have 125 different spices registered, um, but there's, there's also a million different spice blend combinations as well that are also different. So I will never run out of things to, to I will never run out of ideas to put onto my content that provides value for the people who are reading it. As long as I stay committed and I constantly uh, want to learn and, and study different cultures and different foods and stuff, I know that I'll always be able to create interesting content for people, which which I think, per, from a personal point of view, I think that's what's going to help me drive my business and, and be able to earn a living doing something that I love. It's like if I'm in the kitchen mixing spices, I'm talking to Alexa, we're, we're listening to some Oasis. Alexa's the only person who listens to me in this house, Steve. But honest to God, I'm in a house full of girls, I know every little boy's so, all... Um, I'll, I'll be in the kitchen doing what I love and making a living from it. So um, I know I'll stay committed to it forever, you know. Because that's, I think, something where I was keen to kind of have you on this is that with, okay. I don't think you can fake video because I say it every week, but yeah. almost people have a good bullshit meter. And it's when yeah, yeah. people will be able to tell and feel your passion for what your topic is. Okay. That yeah. actually it's, you know, that's what makes the difference between you and your competitors or someone else. That just isn't That's as it. genuine. Without a doubt. And you nailed if... it, Steve. Like, I went to a food show in uh, Birmingham. I think it was the, the the fine food show. It was last year, 20, uh, yeah, 2019. I went I went to that. And one of my um, competitors, well, I mean, I'm not their competitor. It, it really is David versus Goliath Schwartz. You know, the, excuse me, it was all Del Paso. Um, the guy at the stand was just sat on his phone looking unapproachable. And I thought... You're a big, massive multinational company, thousands of pounds, uh, millions of pounds to spend on advertising, but you'll never have this. You haven't but got the my difference is there <laughs> is that he is the guy that you wear when you're a salesman paid for someone else. And I almost find this. I don't this... know. Steve, if you ever saw me at an event, I'm bouncing off the walls. I really <laughs> am. <laughs> my point is that the nobody that is a paid employee, within reason for a yeah. company, will ever be as committed as passionate as the owner course and yeah, it's, it's definitely for some of the companies that i work with especially at the moment when times are tough you know the business yeah. owners have to look after themselves first because you know yeah. it's the whole thing you have to put your own oxygen mask on before you can help other people but i think it's that yeah. you know realistically the the being genuine is what will make a difference and just definitely. because obviously this is kind of a business related live stream and stuff do you want to describe your business model because you have uh, different yeah. sec, you know, parts to it? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll I'll do my social media. I'll post a, a variety of different things, all related to in and untoward way about uh, food and spices and recipes and things like that. And what I was doing is I was attending some uh, markets, farmers markets and, and normal markets around the northeast, which was great. Um, I didn't get to do that many yet because I'm only six months in and we have 
the situation at the moment. We we also had a lot of adverse weather, which cancelled a few markets as well. And the, some of the markets that I did attend had ad, adverse weather, and a lot of my spices blew away. So I've got the air, uh, which was fun. <laughs> Chasing yeah. saffron. That, I lost about six grams of saffron in Stockton High Street. So if you're the lucky finder of that, enjoy. Um, so I've got the markets. I've got my online sales. And what I do is I'll – some of the spices I'll blend myself. Some of them um, I'll, I'll buy in from abroad. Some of them I'll get from the UK. It, it really is a mixed bag. It, it all depends on what is what passed the taste tests. So during the 2018 World Cup uh, and last year as well, I started taste testing all of the spice blends and the different spices from different companies on my neighbours and on my friends and just saying, look, rate it out of 10. What do you think? Is it too sharp? Is it, uh, to, is it way too spicy, et cetera? And just, I was doing research, constantly writing it in my little um, my little black book thing. Looked like the workings of a madman, to be honest. But uh, I've done that for like 18 months, two years. And um, also now that we've launched, we're, we're six months in. And listen to what people are asking me. So if, like, for an example, I got a message saying, Peter, can you do me a shawarma mix? And it was a guy who lives on this estate, actually. So... Um, I knocked him one up. I said, it, it's not on my website at the moment, but I can make you a shawarma mix. I've been making it for myself for years. So um, I white labeled it and uh, took it round and he said it was awesome. I knew it was awesome. Anyway, I've been eating it for years, but um, I'm going to add it to the repertoire soon. So it's just basically an online spice merchant business. Um, and I also attend farmer's markets. Um, and also do the food blog and it all just ties in together so it's for anyone that's passionate about food that wants uh kind of authentic uh flavors and different things that you know you probably don't get in tesco or lots of different places i think so and it's also the uh, it's you know the, the curated side to it as well you know so it's the fact that it's someone a real person that arguably yeah. if they really wanted to they could tweet you and say how can I use this? What's the best jerk blend? What's you know? And what they'll get? For, it's so. I'm sorry to jump in there, Steve. It's just so interesting that you said that. Uh, today I had a package go out to somebody who lives locally, um, and they purchased some Chinese salt and pepper seasoning. So what they got in their package was uh, I made some recipe cards on exactly what ingredients you needed to add to this seasoning to make salt and pepper chips and to make salt and pepper chicken. Um, also, like for example, I'm starting to get into retail. So we there is a butcher's in Stokesley, uh, Powell's Butchers, really nice guys, and and their their food's fantastic as well. And um, what I did was they're stocking like a number of the spices. So I made some recipe cards for each spice to have on the counter next to the packet. So then some, because I think not being able to use certain spices, it can put you off. But if somebody thinks ah madras powder ah and there's a recipe for a chicken madras with it, I love that. You know. Just trying to create value for people constantly. No, I think it's spot on. It's funny because I'm a terrible cook and I'm just, it just doesn't, okay. my passion goes into this. And actually we spoke yeah. before we came on, the amount of effort that I put into this is obscene. That is, yeah. that, that's my kind it of is. thing. Um, Good for you. Anyway, but you know, but I appreciate people that do and it's almost how do you get them to taste it and then kind of convert them. Just thinking out loud, actually, it's almost where, you know, ways to, get the spices in people's mouths yeah. i was trying to think through actually because obviously a lot of the say engineering events that you used to go to yes yeah. it'd be brilliant to kind of just give taste tests but the issue is often what? venues won't let you because they provide the food yeah but it's yeah, just they, they have uh, catering com catering companies who they've used for years and stuff like that and relationships have been built and stuff yeah i think um with the amount of different farmers markets that there are, there's some amazing ones in the North East, there really is. Um, I think there's enough of those markets. I want to get to a point where um, we're, we're attending like four, five, six different markets at the same time with staff who I trust, who I've vetted, who I've trained how to use these different spices. So that's kind of a long-term goal for me to be at different markets at the same time, you know. No, it's cool. It's funny, actually, with um, obviously it's the name of my business, the roadmap, but I do like to plan out how my stuff is going to go. Um, and it's always good to have the ambitions and really kind of go for it. And actually, one of my previous guests, Martin, started arguably as a, as a window cleaner, which is what he was. And now he runs a massive business with hundreds of people because he had a dream. Yeah. And it's that kind of thing where he's from the Northeast. You're yeah. from the Northeast. It, it's just 
what I'm keen to get across is that you don't have to, a lot of the business owners that I know, uh, well, at least when I was growing up, they weren't, they weren't people like me or you. And actually, yeah. but the truth is, you know, it's not like that. And then like one of the things that I also find funny is that the amount of people that now learn stuff on YouTube because they're passionate about guitar or whatever, that actually yeah. it's, it does a lot of the previous barriers to communicate to people, to teach them skills and get your stuff out there yeah. aren't there anymore. So the internet's really- just opened it up completely, you know, like the the, so the way that social media is made, it, it's basically give everybody an opportunity, like no matter what your niche is, you could be, you know, you could start um, a blog about non-league football or you could, there could be a cartoon that you like, whatever. Uh, there's always going to be an audience for anything that's rem- remotely popular. So anybody can do it, like no matter what the business idea is, as long as you're passionate about your subject and you're putting out content that creates value and you're optimistic and you're patient, etc., if good things will happen, you know, you just don't know what opportunities are going to come knocking. Like it's mad. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I got uh, an email that, that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have been putting all this content out. Um, a hospitality company in London just said, Peter, um, we're, we're looking for a spice expert. I thought, well, all right, yeah, I've done it for a couple of years. Let's have it. She said, would you do a presentation to our staff? They need training on the origins of different spices. I said, that would be right up my street. I, I'm all over that. I'd love to do that. And and you just can't predict the opportunities that are going to come. I mean, with that Morocco video that we t- touched upon, uh, searching for spices, which you can find on YouTube, Um yeah. From that, I got back and I, I ended up on BBC Radio. It was weird, man, hearing my voice on the radio. But I ended up in in the Gazette. I had loads of inboxes from my friends saying, you're in the Gazette. I'm like, I know, I can't believe it. But you've just got to ride the waves and just not be nervous about it and just put yourself out there, you know. On the social media point, and it was one of my questions, which I've got kind of listed down. Yeah. I think, again, a lot of people... Um, play it play at it but actually yeah. do you want to talk people through what your graft is uh, because i think actually yeah, okay. telling people what platforms you use how you use it how often you do it and almost the stuff yeah. that you do and then we'll kind of play off that for a little bit yeah okay so for an example right uh, after we finish this i need to make a couple of, of bits for social media so what i'll do I'll choose an, an ingredient, for example. Uh, let's say we're going to talk about tamarind, the spice that you get from uh, the Far East. I'm going to talk, I'm going to get a picture of tamarind. Um, there's a lot of free sites that you can use. Unsplash is a brilliant site, full of nice free stock photos. Um, it's quite limited, but um, if you're in a position where you're just starting out and you haven't got the funds to go out and pay a photographer, then maybe find some free stock photos. Uh, find some information about it that creates value for people, i.e. how to cook with it. And then what I'll do is I'll post it on Instagram. I'll post it on Instagram stories. I'll post it on Facebook and Facebook stories. I'll slightly amend it uh, for Twitter. And then I'll slightly amend it for Pinterest as well. So we've already got six pieces of content going out there. Then I'll post it on Snapchat stories. And then I'll have a think about making a, a video for YouTube and TikTok. Um, I'll, I used to use Tumblr and Peach, but they've kind of died a bit of a death. Um, have I missed any any of them out? Uh, also, LinkedIn. Um, you obviously have to. LinkedIn's very businessy, so you've got to be all official uh, for LinkedIn. Um, so I can't write in my accent. I, I sometimes do, but um, just on that make some point, content. yeah. There's okay. a lot of the the, the world leading marketers would say actually you should right as you okay there's a guy called okay. dg uh, actually i'll send yeah. you a link so there's an initiative yeah. called a marketing meetup it's a guy called joe glover that runs it he's yeah. a former guest um okay I'll but actually <laughs> but so every tuesday they do a live webinar with okay. like genuine like shit hot experts of different stuff but like genuinely yeah. well like gary lee v kind of level you know proper oh, proper okay. stuff and awesome. one of the big things, it's almost about being genuine, is actually people should yeah. just talk as they speak because it's that, so. it's that balance. And even the Tuesday is one, what day are we on? Thursday. I lose track of the days when lockdown. Um, yeah, man. The guy was a, a LinkedIn kind of expert and he was saying actually yeah. the more simple you can communicate your language, 
people actually yeah. perceive it as being more intelligent because you can communicate it. So my point is just just talk. Because I think what I yeah, found man. quite funny was that I used to be very good at LinkedIn. And I think actually yeah. when I was thinking this through, when I was really unhappy in a former job, I kind of went into Michelle a little bit. And it was only okay. when it was a guy called Kevin Ness who works at Wilton again in Borough. He said to me at an event, he said, oh, Steve, I haven't seen any of your posts in a while. And actually, I got quite yeah. upset because at that single point, I realized I twigged. And it was because I was unhappy. I'd stopped posting and I'd stopped Because post- creativity is being stifled by your environment and it's 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 affecting the, your output. But actually, when uh, I'd kind of, you know, broke free, gone to do this, and I just started yeah. to become happy again, I just, yeah. I do it because I enjoy it. But actually, I yeah. don't hustle in the same way. So I concentrate maybe harder on fewer platforms. And that's just based on yeah. my target audience. So LinkedIn's massive for me. Uh, yeah, Twitter is actually really picked up a lot. So again, I'm starting to do a lot more in the kind of Northeast tech scene. And a lot of the people in that oh, yeah. audience, um, that's how they communicate. Uh, and again, yeah, a lot I totally of- understand. It's, it's like a lot of my target audience are on Instagram because it's quite visual. It's very food orientated. So I get a lot of um, I get a lot of interaction through through Instagram and through Facebook as well um, because there's a lot of foodies on there who you you know you maybe wouldn't find on LinkedIn. But I think LinkedIn's starting to become more and more popular. I remember yeah. using it years ago, and it was just people would constantly spam yeah and that does still happen to a certain extent but like now it's a it's a content creator isn't it and and you can write about like i'll write about for example i put a recipe on the pages that i mentioned and then on linkedin i'd maybe say been creating content all day writing recipes and putting them on twitter etc just just kind of amend it because one if you if you perfectly replicate a quote and post it on 10 social media platforms some will perform really well and some will perform really poorly so you've just got to adjust how you're approaching it based on the the audience on that particular social media platform no it's cool i think the i was just keen to kind of share some of the the effort that people should go into and should do yeah and just to kind of you know talk because one of the most valuable pieces of insight that any salesperson should have when they go and knocking doors is sharing yeah. market intelligence about what that company's competitors are doing who's doing what and again for what i'm doing now i think people find it useful to see other people that all run their own business how, how yeah. do they do it how does that work i get a lot of people asking me about yeah. live streaming and it's that kind of thing where it's why I'm not afraid to kind of try different things and tell people yeah. how it works. You've got to be kind of open about it. Like, for example, I learned um, a skill from watching Gary Vee and what he does to anyone who's watching this. If you want to grow your audience on Twitter or Instagram, if I was to go onto my phone now, search Middlesbrough and then recent posts and scroll through it and every food picture that I see, I'm leaving a comment, man. I'm saying, oh, you put pistachios with that, love that. Uh, I'll say, what spices did you use? Um, or I'll say something like, that chicken chihuahua looks incredible. I'm going to go and get one in a bit. Um, and I'll just keep leaving comments that kind of create value. And what you find is when you're leaving comments on people's posts, they tend to follow your page. So instead of going and paying like fortunes for new followers, you can earn followers just maybe an hour every day of just – um, they call it the dollar eighty technique, uh, and it really does work. You can do it on Twitter as well. Search for a hashtag that's relevant to your business. So I would do hashtag spices for it, just for example, and then I'll I'll just go on there just for an hour, just leaving different comments, and and you end up drawn into some really interesting conversations. To be fair, so no, I think it's a really good show. Yeah. I think for me, when I start doing more of the scalable business education type stuff, which is uh, yeah. You know, it's a it's a higher volume, repeatable, scalable thing that I'll start yeah. doing that. But actually, that's a really good point because one of the things I used to really enjoy, which we haven't done for a while, but it was partly to do with lockdown and partly because actually my sales effort actually worked, um, was that after we met for coffee in Costa, because we both follow, followed Gary Vee and he talks about the hustle, doing kind of different things. When I set up the business, I kind of made a promise to myself that. I'd be happy to call it quits if I'd approached a thousand people in my sales effort to actually kind of hustle and properly like this is the direct approach. Hi, Peter, can we have a chat? I think I can help. And basically what one of the things that we did was I think, remember, if I got to 200, Peter, I'm at 200. It was almost like an account- accountability coach yeah, yeah, I was choosing yeah. to do. Uh, and actually it got to the point where I got to 467 
and I was already on the verge of being sold out. So I kind of slowed down. Yeah. And then actually yeah. one of the things that I've kind of found now is it's the balance of where you have to assume, well, if you're sensible, you have to assume that you're going to lose customers at some point. Because actually, if you go and do a good yeah. job, help them turn the company around, they're not going to always need you. And then it's yeah. that balance of at what point do I start to crank the handle again? Uh, yeah. But it was just, it was the concept of, I still found it very useful to have, you weren't my accountability coach, but actually yeah. I knew you would appreciate the hustle in actually yeah. celebrating the little wins because often, especially Definitely, when you start like, out and you're not making any money. I think like what you can do, Steve, is like when you're like connecting with other people, like say you were starting a business um, or it's something you're thinking about, start hanging out with people who have a business or who are thinking about it because you learn so much by just bouncing ideas off each other. Like there's people who I, for example, guys I used to work with who uh, we'll meet, oh, obviously not right now, but when, when things are back to, when normality returns soon, um, we would walk the dogs together and we'd just bounce ideas about, man, and you learn so much by, by doing that. And you can also stop yourself from making mistakes like I could come out with an idea and someone could say, oh, you know what, I tried that and, and this is the problem I encountered. You can learn so much by just interacting with, with people who've got a similar mindset. Based on that, and I was spinning off that, there's, I think, aim at the, the level above where you currently are as well. I think I, I yeah. see certain kind of networks where everyone's patting each other on the back and telling each other how wonderful they are. Yeah. But actually, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been on what your ambitions are, you know, you might want to aim higher. And it's just, it's, yeah, it's, I get that. I think that now I've became immune to the um, Peter, you're amazing, all that. Like people who I grew up with and that, and they're, they're, you know, good guys. And people would say, ah, oh, you know, you're running your own company, you're traveling in the world, you, you, you're smashing it. And I think, well, I'm doing okay. You know what I mean? There's a lot of improvements that can be made. But at the same time, I, I, if there's any criticism that I don't think, like, which is unfounded, then, I, it doesn't affect me you know i think you've got to learn and not let other people's opinions affect you emotionally and affect your decision making whereas from a contradictory point of view at the same time you need to listen to what people are saying because kind of the market decides whether your business is viable so it's kind of two, it's two different opposite ends of the scale you have to learn to ignore people's judgment but at the same time you need to know what the market's saying if that makes sense. No, it doesn't. Because the way that I kind of tried to describe it to a lady called Ashley, I was on her podcast, was that yeah. if, ironically, I have nobody that tells me I'm doing well, apart from you, but it's, but the, the, my point was almost that the, if you're Usain Bolt and he goes to the Olympics yeah. and he comes in fifth, people would think it was a tragedy. They're not going to pat him on the yeah. back. And no. the point is that as you... I almost treat it as almost a badge of honor when people stop saying well done because it proves that you've leveled up that that then becomes normal. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, but it's, it's true that with, I've, have I? No, I don't think I've, I have anyone that bigs me up and it's just, but I'm, yeah. I'm fine with it because actually I'm doing this because I enjoy it. And as long as I can, yeah. I've, I've said it publicly in the past, my target for this year was to do 18,000 in the year. And that was just yeah. enough to cover all my bills, everything. And actually, yeah. when you were saying before about the car thing, so I've got, you know, quite a nice car. Um, but actually, the it's up at the end of the year. And the funny thing is, is that when I was growing up, I had dreams. And I always wanted to own a Porsche, which is a chat that we've had in the past. Yeah. And then I always I was aiming for it, but I was aiming for that because I was a 12 to 13-year-old boy, that it was never going to happen. That <clears throat> You know, it was yeah. just... But the point is, once I kind of I had one... And there was a lot of kind of stuff that kind of went with it because my, yeah. anyway, we had, uh, anyway, uh, but almost going through that point and even the car I've got now, <clears throat> because I'm getting my fulfillment and stuff from the business and the craft and creating stuff. Yeah. I'm half tempted to let it go in December. Yeah. It'll save me 600 quid a month, uh, you know, yeah. on, on my tax and insurance. And yeah. All and the that. costs that go with it. And then yeah. we've got a, a Kia as well, which I've had for 10 years almost but i love it it's just it's a good sort of car but actually it just again reduces my overheads and one of the things from a business point yeah. of view is i'm then yeah. now considering if i was to reinvest that 600 quid every month what could yeah. i do with it and it's but it's that balance of where almost my it ironically other people probably think that i buy fancy cars 
to make myself look good. And I don't, because some people do do that. I think go, that's just because though, Steve, so many people are in that mindset. So like, you'll get a lot of, I think we've discussed it before, like, you'll get a lot of people who are doing a job they don't like to buy a car they can't afford to, to impress people they don't like, which is just crazy. But like, if you genuinely love a car, like I have had cars in the past where, uh, you know, I, I love the speed that it has and uh, or I love the, the interior, for example. Like I, I'm doing it because I love that particular uh, machine. Whereas like a lot of people will get a car just to kind of keep up with the Joneses. You see it on estates all over the UK, which is kind of a bit of a mad mindset, really. Like you've the just thing got that, to do what you the want. The you know, now got is almost where... Ironically, the business is going really well, and actually, I'm doing a hell of a lot better than I ever thought I would. But then yeah. I'm half tempted to drive a ten-year-old Kia because actually, I love yeah. the car. I don't need to prove yeah. it. But then you know, you, you've also got the, the balance of where, again, if I'm driving into up to people's companies to help them turn around the company, I get that. There's that yeah. perception, and it's there's almost that perception as well in your business. Yeah, I get. That so I've got completely. six months to decide what to do, but it is something I'm genuinely considering. And actually, yeah. you know, almost with coronavirus, it forced me to take more of my stuff online. Obviously, you're attending yeah. less in-person kind of network events, but doing more of this. And then likewise, you know, if I want to take the company, I could invest the same money that was going in a car into online yeah. profile building, live stream and whatever. Gosh, and you can yeah. do a hell of a lot with 600 quid a month. Um, yeah. I am conscious that we've been talking for a while. You're one of the few people that can talk more than I can. And actually, it's been a few times that you've probably had me kind of belly laughing a little bit. Um, one thing that I think could be quite interesting, and it's more just how you came about. How did you start to learn Arabic? Um, through necessity, really. Just through... Um... I knew I was, I went to Sharm El Sheikh and I knew that I was going to end up traveling the region. I know what I'm like. And um, I just wanted to know what was being said around me. I'm there with my, my girlfriend. I'm there with her family. And, it, you know, it, it is a, a bot. Parts of that region are a little bit volatile. So just to be on the safe side, it's nice to know what's being said around you, really. Um, and then what, when I started using Arabic in the hotels and stuff in Egypt, and I'm getting such like a, a wow reaction from the locals. That kind of taught me that, you know what, for the little tiny bit of effort it takes to watch a few YouTube videos, write some phrases down, box them off and use them, then it's completely worth your time, really. Because um, I, I think never for your been... business, I think there's actually a big opportunity there. Mad how it's all worked out. Because in the 90s and the early 2000s, there used to be a guy on Spanish TV who was a scouser and his Spanish was oh, yeah. terrible. But right. it was the novelty of the thing. And he basically he made it on Spanish TV. But it's almost where yeah. you could use it as a genuine you know, USP that yeah. you know, I don't have. That I think you could do a hell of a lot with that. You know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, I think it's a tool you should use. It is. I, it came across quite well in the video. Like when I made the Morocco video searching for spices, I remember walking through like a beautiful blue alley in the Medina. And I'm, I'm talking on the phone, uh, talking to my, my camera. And um, some guy, I've got to bump into some guy, and I'm like, Ana Asef Sadiki, which is, I'm sorry, my friend. And I'm like, yes, yeah, sir, I just said I'm, I'm sorry in Arabic, in my strongest boy accent. And it is something different, isn't it? And it makes the company stand out for me, like, definitely. Cool. Um, so as I kind of come to wrap up, the uh, there's normally two questions I ask people, but okay. I'm going to throw in a third for you because you're a food-based okay. business. So I'm going to start with that one. So, yeah. what is the best meal you've ever eaten? Ooh. Fisherman's Wharf, San Francisco, 2012. Uh, clam chowder with uh, sourdough bread. Uh, incredible. I, I've also had clam chowder on Fisherman's Wharf at one of the restaurants. Yeah. I was there for, a, oh God, it- when was it? Uh, 2010, I think. It was a PhD conference. Nice oh, it, was, it was brilliant because you got all the seals. Uh, and yeah. it's just... Uh, just around down the road, yeah. So ironically, what, it's a nice place, San Francisco. Clam chowder's got absolutely nothing to do with spices. <laughs> I know. <laughs> fair fair yeah. enough. If that's your answer, that's your answer. That's my answer. Fair enough. Okay, so now back to the two questions I actually ask everyone. Um, what's the best? <laughs> Sorry, you can't be other. What's the best piece of advice you've ever had? 
Oh, uh, I'll have to go. It's going to have to be a Gary V related one because I've learned so much from him. Um, I would say patience and optimism. He mentions those two words a lot, and it's been vital in my business, really. I mean, in my life, I have taken a lot of inspiration from different people. Like, they've all been equally as important as this at the time. So, like, growing up, listening to Eminem, got a lot of inspiration from Eminem. Um, I think at the moment as well, Ty- Tyson Fury's saying a lot of really, really sensible things. I think, to be fair, he's came from the depths of despair to becoming one of the best heavyweights of all time. And a lot of what Tyson Fury says, really sensible. I think he's a really inspirational guy, actually. Um, but I am going to stick with Gary V, patience and optimism. No, cool. I must say I've got uh, Tyson Fury's book. And actually, I had uh, Middlesbrough boxer Gemma Fosa on uh, two weeks okay. ago. And yeah. Uh, obviously, yeah, we were talking through boxing. And it's funny with Tyson Fury, when he, I first became aware of him when he fought Klitschko, and in okay. the run-up to that, I wasn't quite sure. He was quite abrasive and he was wearing Batman yeah, suits. But actually, now the more I know about him, and actually there was a documentary on ITV quite recently. I really like him. I saw it. It was great. It was class, wasn't it? Really likeable guy. Okay, so that was the first question. And the next question almost is, if you were to give advice to your younger self, what would it be? Oh. I wish I'd have travelled more. I mean, I know I've done a lot of travelling in the last 10 years, but I didn't start travelling until I was 23. So I wish that in my teens and in my early 20s, I'd have maybe done a bit of backpacking. Um, I mean, moving forward, the next few things, I, I really want to go to Beirut. I really want to go to uh, Damascus in Syria. I know that sounds a bit bonkers, but it's happening. Um, same with places like Indonesia, the Spice Islands there, uh, India and things like that. There's a lot of places that I wish I'd have already travelled to, but I haven't. Um, I'm also going to, at some point, drive from Cairo down to Cape Town. So after I've finished my Searching for Spices series that I'm putting together for YouTube, I'm going to do that. And after the African escapades, I'd like to walk the PCT. You can walk from Mexico to Canada, you know, Steve. Um, the, the Pacific Crest Trail can walk from the length of the USA. I bet you that's an interesting trek. I must say, so, when, yeah, I wish I'd have done more travel, basically. When we first, I say first, mate, when we met Acosta, one of the things that I really liked, it, I remember you saying, was that with part of the reason why you wanted to do this and do what you were doing was almost to give your kids a better life, to allow them to travel and see things that you never Definitely. had. Definitely. I know, I, yeah, think, we'll I think it's awesome. Thanks, cool. man. I really appreciate that. One, I appreciate the opportunity. It's been good crack. No, you I was, would be. <laughs> I was going to say, the one of the questions I always ask is almost, you know, have you got, is there anything going on at the moment that you want to plug? Anything on the website, um, anything? I think if, if you'd like to follow Diablo Seasonings, I'm just constantly putting food related content out there. So trying to put recipes out there, how to cook with different spices and stuff. And also if you go onto YouTube and search Diablo Seasonings, you can watch me wander in the spice markets in my borough top looking pretty out of place. And in the future, when I go to places like Beirut, it's going to be interesting watching a borough lad walking around the markets. Um, so if you fancy that, give Diablo Seasonings a follow across social media. Thanks yeah, very much. That's awesome. Cool. Well, I'm going to wrap it up there. Uh, what I tend to do, just because, again, we were talking before about some of the social media kind of side of things. So I actually record yeah. this on software called OBS, okay. which yeah. saves it as a basic movie file. I put that into Final Cut Pro. Then I cut okay. it up. I, I, I'll i probably spend the next two hours now re-watching this, editing it. I turn that into six or seven different clips, which will post a day at a time every so often. Okay, cool. Uh, one change which I'm going to make, which is after the webinar I watched on Tuesday, is the first kind of 10 minutes, because LinkedIn caps your videos at 10 minutes, is take yeah. it, put that natively on LinkedIn, because yeah. apparently I was getting told off by the algorithm because I was sending people directly to YouTube. So I've been told not to do that now. But again, this is just yeah, part of the learning curve. Yeah, to do it directly through LinkedIn, yeah. And it's just, it's just, you know, I've really enjoyed the chat today. My hope is that there might be one person watching who says, actually, That's I like it. that guy. I see what he's doing. I'm trying to start my pick a business, pick any business. And again, it's one of the things that I'm kind of, you know, I like it when people reach out and they start to connect. And it's just, you know, there's a lot of really kind of good networks and good people around. And actually, we're all kind of on this journey together. Uh, you know, I've really enjoyed chatting. You, you had me proper laughing a few times. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll, kind of, we'll, we'll stay in touch. And we'll grab another Costa uh, at some point when we're allowed back out again. 
No bother, Steve. Well, look, if I end up going to Brazil at any point, are you coming, like? You know <laughs> your way about, don't you? It depends how much it is. When um, we almost got our passports stolen in Sao Paulo uh, by people... Standard. Standard. <laughs> But actually, Rio was nice. Rio is probably its second on the list, second or third. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we've got New York is top. Love New York for many different reasons. I actually love Rome because it's equally good. I can hear your dog going. Don't worry, we're going to finish. That's fine. All right, my dog's gone bonkers. But Rome, again, with the food, I uh, just love it traveling around because we walk everywhere. And Rio was third. Less so for the food, but just the, the visuals and the sights yeah. and stuff as well. Cool. Genials from Sao Paulo. Well, there you go. Drop him a message. <laughs> take okay. care Steve no take care cheers mate bye bye